Can we move on to the next slide, please? So I'd like to start with a little bit of background about Verdant, and then we will talk about our health program process, our priorities, the applications, how we evaluate and score applications, and then frequently asked questions. We will also cover two additional funding sources that we offer here at Verdant, one for COVID-19 emergencies, and then another fund that we use for emergency projects. And finally, we will close with a Q&A session. Next slide. I am pleased to share with you uh, our superintendent uh, and team as well that support grant making. And this is only a small fraction because actually most of our team is involved in grant making one way or the other. So I'm the superintendent. Zoe Reese is our director of community impact and grant making. Unfortunately, she's not able to be with us today and she will be available by email for questions that you may have for follow-up. Thea Walker is our community impact and grant making intern and also our digital communications specialist who is joining us today. And we have a brand new grants manager joining us on April 11th, so our team is growing. Additionally, we have other team members who help us with scoring who are joining us today. So I believe we have Nancy Budd and Sandra Huber, as well as Monica Starr and Casey Kelly. So we definitely have a dedicated team uh, supported to helping our community partners through the grant making process. We have five elected commissioners who review and approve all grants that we award. Our newest commissioner is Carolyn Brennan. And our board president is Dr. Jim Disselhorse. Our board secretary is Kariana Wilson. To see the full staff uh, profiles, you can visit our website at verdanthealth.org and learn about our amazing team. Many people ask us as to which grants get funded and which ones do not. And we refer them back to the mission and vision of Verdant because we are looking for community projects that align with our focus. Specifically, we are dedicated to improving the health and well being of our whole community. And that is in South Snohomish County specifically. As a public hospital district number two, we are governed by a board of voted, voter elected commissioners who by law and by bylaw approve all of our grant awards. Next slide. Where? Here's a little overview of the work of Verdant in 2021, just to give you a recap of the projects that we've, some of the projects that we funded. And I think we're trying to get that video up. So I appreciate your patience for just a moment. Okay, it looks like that link doesn't work, Casey. So maybe we can go straight to the link off of our website and you can share. Emma, just looking for that link there. We appreciate your patience for just a moment as we get that link set up for you. In the meantime, I'll continue on this slide. So here is an overview of our funding history. Uh, in 2011, when the former Stevens Hospital uh, evolved into a doing business as the Verdant Health Commission, we began funding one-time and multi-year grants. And we 
reviewed the grant applications monthly and we had special calls for proposals. That was through 2019. Then COVID hit and we pivoted and we went to COVID-19 emergency grants and gave out about a million dollars a year in emergency grants in both 2020 and 2021. In 2021, we moved to quarterly uh, grant making to improve our time with the grant applicants to help them navigate our process. And in 2021, we also went to an online grant making system that we call Flux, which is our grant portal. You can access it off our website and we'll be walking you through that in this presentation as well. So if you are a new grant seeker or have not applied with Verdant since we went to an online grant portal, we'll give you the instructions today and we're also available to help you get your profile set up so that you can apply for funding. And I think we have the video. Casey for making that available and finding that link. I really appreciate it. We're going to move on to our next slide. Uh, for those of you who are interested in providing services to the residents of South Snohomish County, here is our boundary map that we use. So these are the cities that we support, municipalities, Edmonds, Woodway, City of Linwood, City of Montlake Paris, Fire and then part of the city of Bothell. And our next map shows the overlay with the Edmonds School District. So you can see that our service area as a public hospital district almost perfectly lines up with the Edmonds School District map, just to give you an idea of boundaries. There's a little bit of area that we cover that they don't and vice versa. And just to help bring this uh, to a little bit more clarity, here are the zip codes of the residents. It's just about 200,000 residents that we support and provide access to services for. And that is our focus, our, our services within these zip codes. And now I'm going to turn it over to our colleague and dear team member, Sandra Huber, to walk through our grant making and give you an overview. And just to remind you, this is being recorded in case you'd like to come back and watch this at a later date, it will be on our website. Thank you and welcome Sandra. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome everyone to this presentation. It's always a pleasure to share um, how proud we are of the work that we do here at Verdant and to clarify any questions that any of you or community members may have. So what's the purpose of our grants? And the answer is pretty simple. Um, as you heard Lisa speak about our vision, we support projects within the South Snohomish County um, service area that also support our mission. We also are looking, always looking for projects that address priorities as identified by the Board of Elected Commissioners that we introduced you to in the previous slide. Next slide, please. 
So um, if you're wondering which one are our priority areas, there are a lot of things that, uh, that our communities need, but these are the top areas of priority that our commissioners have identified. Access to health care, behavioral health, childhood obesity, dental care, food security, housing, other education and prevention, as well as supporting our seniors. Next, please. So what do we mean when we say access to health care? Basically, we're talking about uh, opportunities for our residents to access good, safe health care in an appropriate care setting. We also um, recognize behavioral health as one of our priorities and making it open and accessible for residents to have uh, resources dedicated to mental health, substance use, and, uh, and within uh, community-based centers when it's uh, possible. Childhood ob obesity, um, and it's important to remember that our families are the core of the work that, um, that we try to support within our community. And it's important for us that to reduce child obesity, we, uh, we allow our community to have access, or we support more than allow, um, for them to have access to education, services, and food to support healthy lifestyles. Next slide, please. When we're talking about dental care, we want residents to have access to good, safe dental care in an appropriate setting. Especially during the pandemic, we have all heard and um, have had information about food insecurity. So we want to support uh, residents to not go hungry and have access to healthy and nutritious uh, food to support their health needs. And when we talk about housing, we are not talking about building housing, but supporting residents so they are housed in affordable housing and are giving opportunities to maintain cost-effective housing so they can use an appropriate amount of their income for the other needs that they have, like food, medical care, and child care, as, as a few of them. Other education and prevention, we offer residents uh, access to supportive services that um, address the social determinants of health broadly and our emerging needs like COVID has been. And we support our older adults or elderly in our community that are um, for them to be safely and respectfully supported in a healthy environment. Next slide, please. So when, when we talk about our funding, sometimes people ask, well, what, are, what is the criteria? What are the funding parameters? And one of the things that's important for everyone to know is that there is no minimum or maximum request, though in, on average, we get our, our, our requests tend to be around $99,000, a little more, a little less. And the, uh, it's important that they prioritize direct program expenses and our, um, our grant allocations may fund multiple programs in each priority area that must be used to serve Sonsonomish County residents. And we're going back to the maps that were shared by um, our superintendent earlier in this presentation that clearly define what our service area is will not be awarded for the benefit of an individual person for political or religious uses to retire debt or strictly for fundraising purposes and will not be awarded in this cycle for programs that are solely capital and equipment requests. Next slide, please. So the way we have our, um, our application divided, we have different uh, points um, structures that are allocated per diff for each one of these different um, criteria. The opportunity, community need, it's important that it's something that the community identifies as something that is needed. The impact and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. The desired outcomes, that those are clear, and implementation. So if you are interested in um, reviewing this evaluation criteria. We're going to be putting the link on the chat for the evaluation criteria at verdonhealth.org. Next slide, please. So uh, one thing that changed everything in our lives, as you all probably would agree, is 
uh, the impact of COVID-19 in our community. So since 2020, we have been finding ways to support community in their specific needs related to COVID-19. So we continue and are now accepting 2022 COVID-19 applications. And it's an opportunity for you to um, visit our website and use our grant portal. We, these are different uh, and are allocated differently than the general grant because these are accepted on a rolling basis and requests are reviewed by the board monthly. And again, just like the regular grants, it has to be for applications that serve South Snohomish County residents that support one of the priorities listed earlier in our presentation and that are short-term projects or pilots. Uh, or pilot projects. So again, here is the link if you want more information about that. Next slide, please. So for the general grant applications, all our applications from now on and since we started our portal are submitted via our grant portal. So you don't have to worry about emailing documents and all that, it's all contained within, um, within our grant portal. Applications for this next uh, quarter two um, application cycle are from April 11 to April 22nd. And we will be awarding the contracts um, beginning July 1st through September 30th. And you will be contacted after June 28th uh, board meeting, which is where the decisions are made. Once again, here is the um, website where you um, will be going if you want to know more and also if you want to apply. Next slide, please. So um, our team has been working really hard and making all this information as easy to, um, to understand and to apply. And um, we, we want to show you a little video of an explanation of walking you through what you will be um, working with once you go to our website. This is a video tutorial on signing up for your grantee portal account. So you're gonna start at the Verdant Health Commission Grants Portal home screen. You'll see um, our logo in the top center. And you'll see on one side it says login now and the other side has this I think we accidentally. You're thank gonna you. want to scroll down to the bottom of the welcome text and click this create an account now. You will click there, and you will be met with some eligibility criteria. Please note that you must pass this, these eligibility requirements in order to be taken to the next step of inputting your organization information. So if the answers that you entered do not pass, so if you fail this eligibility requirement uh, quiz, mm -hmm. you will receive an error message and will not be able to move forward. Flex. Uh, the first question is that your program takes place within our uh, service area. Your next question will be um, that you deliver services that improve the health and wellness of our community. Uh, the next one is that your services increase access to our priority areas. Um, this one is acknowledging that your funds um, would not be used for the benefit of individual person um, or for political or religious uses, um, et cetera. And your last one is that you have a business license or a fiscal agent are eligible to receive a grant uh, from a public agency. So once you acknowledge all of those, you will hit the submit <coughs> button. So if I hit submit, I will come to this screen where I'm going to input the info about my organization. So you'll put your organization name here. Anything? with this red asterisk is required. So that is what that little red asterisk signifies. You're gonna to wanna to include your address, city, state, so on and so forth. You then will want to include your organization phone number. 
and your organization email. Then you'll want to include your tax ID here and your organization mission statement here. Um, this one, your organization summary is not required, but it is important for you to fill out the organization summary and the mission statements as these are automatically pulled into your funding request. So um, please note that and make sure um, that you also keep them up to date once you are in flux as well. And then the next step is going to be your primary contact info. So this is your contact information. Um, for yourself. And again, anything with the red asterisk here is required. So you're going to want to review this information before you submit it. Um, if you do submit and you realize something is wrong, you will be able to edit this information later so there is no stress there um, you will hit the submit request button and you will receive this uh, memo that tells you um, that your information has been submitted and you'll receive an email from us within um, two business days that is really important because if you are planning on filling out an application you will want to sign up and give yourself a few days um, after signing up before you fill out the application. So do not expect to fill out your application immediately after um, setting up your account as it does take a couple days for that confirmation email um, to be sent to you. This is an overview of the organizations tab in the grantee portal. So we're going to start here at your uh, portal home screen and over at this menu on the left hand side, you're going to see this organization's tab. It. It's going to take you through the whole playlist if you keep going. Okay, so I hope that that brief presentation was helpful. Um, we have posted on chat a few of the links that you have seen through the presentation, including um, how to create a grant portal account and submit in an application. So um, we, we are now going to uh, talk a little bit about the application materials and just have an overview. There are six application sections, six groupings of information that you will find on the, uh, on the application. The organization information, the program details, budget, outcomes, acknowledgement, and any other attached documents that you are um, intending to submit and submit and each section must be filled out completely in order for it to allow you to move to the next item or to submit the entire application next slide please required documents pretty self-explanatory um, we want information about the organization's board of directors if you had um, board of directors with their affiliations. It's important to have your current financial statements and if you have other agencies or their groups that you're working with to um, submit letters of support if you have indicated you're partnering with other organizations and other attachments uh, are accepted but they're not require an example of that would be an annual report or any other documentation that you feel that is pertinent and relevant to your application next slide please um, one thing that it's important to keep in mind that for some of you it would be a renewal of an application and not necessarily a brand new application if you have applied for more than one year so for year two or year three renewal the information will be automatically pulled from the original application um, and we have introduced to flux 
applications that were not initially submitted in Flux, but that now have been um, inputted into the system. So the fields automat automatically fill will remain locked. And it's important that, that you're aware that our requirements are that you update the outcomes to you if you haven't updated uh, any changes, updated budget if there is a, a change, Cur current financial documents and re-acknowledgements of the four statements in the acknowledgement area of the application for renewal. Next slide, please. So for outcomes, this is the screen that you would see and um, the uh, requests for editing if you are doing a renewal are just a little different than if it's a first time application. So you'll be asked number of individual served. You will be asked, in this case, we're talking about um, made believe application from Zoe's pet um, spa, or I, I believe it was the name that we use as a, as a, as a, um, sample one. So in this case, you'll be wanting to share how many dogs will be spayed or neutered at no charge, uh, cat spayed or neutered at no charge, and community presentations about the, the importance of spaying and neutering. So as you can see, these are all the outcomes that you said or that this person said that we're going to have. So we're asking information about how, how many um, um, people, in this case, pets, will be served. So next slide, please. So when we come to the page uh, about budget, you have the total program budget for year one, and then um, the amount that is requested from Verdon. There are, um, it's always encouraged to partner with other agencies to balance the costs and to keep sustainability. And in this page, you would see the subsidized bay and neuter clinic and the date that it will be taking place and, and what the budget for that is. And also a breakdown um, down below under budget snapshot. Next slide, please. It's important to remember our budget uh, guidelines and, and consider that the administrative expenses that are not specifically allocated to the funded scope of work or function of the funded program and also to take into consideration expenses that are allocated to support multiple programs and locations. And the burden generally limits these expenses to 10% or even less of the total grant request. Next slide, please. There's also a distinction with direct expenses, um, and those are expenses that are allocated to a specific program, and also expenses that would not exist if not because that program that is funded exists. Next slide, please. Minor capital expenses, self-explanatory here too, expenses incurred as a result of the purchase of cap capital items as long as they are less than $5,000 and or have a useful life that is equal to or less than the term of the grant agreement. Most of our grants are three years long, so it has to fall within, at the most, three years um, long. So that would have to um, fall within that amount of time. In general, they're eligible to be funded by Verdon as a part of a grant request. Major capital expenses, those are expenses incurred as a result of the purchase of capital items that cost more than $5,000 and that have a useful life that, that is greater than the maximum amount of a grant agreement. Verdum generally does not fund those and we have done occasionally uh, some exceptions uh, offering capital specific funding opportunities. Those are a case by case. Next, um, financial due diligence, as it says, Verdon requests applicants to provide the appropriate financial information with their applications, and we, um, the applicant, grantee organizations with annual operating expenses that are more than $3 million must annually provide a financial audit performance per performed by an independent accounting firm and applicant grantee organizations with an annual 
um, operating budget less than three million um, must provide a, co a cost report or internally prepared financial statements. Next slide, please. Um, we're adding here as well some um, videos that could, um, the, the particular link that we have here talks about the multi-year application guide, the send back application guide, reports guide, payments guide, and renewal request guide. So I will be posting those on, uh, on chat if you are interested in following up with more information there, as well as a PDF guide at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. So, um, Lisa, I'm wondering if we um, want to move into questions or want to go over the frequently asked questions that might already answer some, some questions people may have on their minds. Would you mind reading, uh, going through those, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Sandra, so much. So one of the common questions we get asked is, do programs, projects need to serve a specific population? The only requirement we have is that services must be delivered within our district boundaries to our residents. Who is eligible to submit an application? A nonprofit, not for profit, or government organization whose program matches our guidelines. So we're looking for alignment with our priorities and yours. If my program or project is currently supported by Vernon and set to expire, can I renew using this process? Absolutely. We encourage you to apply for a renewal in the application window before your current expiration date of the grant you're currently funded through. Next slide, please. Can I submit multiple applications? Absolutely. What has changed with this application process to reflect equity, diversity, and inclusion? We have added a section that requests a description of how your program or project demonstrates equity, diversity, and inclusion, and those being served, increasing access to services, and that will be part of the scoring process. So I need to fill out an entirely excuse me, new application for a year two or year three renewal. No, you only need to <clears throat> update your outcomes, budget and financial statements and acknowledgements. Everything else will automatically be pulled in from your original application. So the nice thing about having an online grant portal is a lot of the information will be put in the first time you apply and then you'll be able to go in and update it, which will make it easier for you to go after future grants. So here is our timeline for this Q2 grant making period. Today, we have the community Q&A. Next Monday, April 11th, our online grant portal opens and we will begin accepting applications. <clears throat> you see that the deadline is April 22nd and Sandra put it in the chat as well. Thank you, Sandra. April 22nd at 5 p.m., our grant portal will close. In May, any new applicants who have not ever received funding from Verdant will meet with our program committee. We have two commissioners on that committee. We'll meet with those new applicants to learn about their programs and more about the organization. On June 9th, we have a program committee review all the applications and recommend those applicants for funding to the full board. On June 29th is our board meeting where those recommendations will come forward to the full board for review and approval. We will be communicating to all applicants that same day as soon as the board uh, makes funding decisions. Our goal is to then begin contracts for funding to flow to organizations who've been awarded grants by July 1st. The next grant making window, if this timing doesn't work for you, will be July 11th. So our goal is to have these funding windows posted so that you can review them. And as you're looking at your projects, decide 
which quarter is the best quarter for your organization to apply. So just to recap, Friday, April 22nd at 5 p.m. Pacific time, our grant portal will close. You can go to www.verdanthealth.org and you will see the grant portal on the upper, uh, upper bar of the website. So it's right there at the top of your screen as you go to verdanthealth.org. If you have any questions whatsoever about the process, you are welcome to send an email to Zoe Reese, our Director of Community Impact and Grant Making. Her email is zoe.reese at verdanthealth.org and her phone number is 425-582-8572. Thank you so much for participating in this process and we would like to open it up to questions that you may have, you're welcome to raise your hand or use a chat to ask a question. You can always also use this QR code that you see on the screen and hover your smartphone over it, open up the photo uh, section. And if you hover over that QR code with your smartphone, it'll open up to the grant making page as well. I'm gonna look at chat and see if we have some questions. Thank you, Lisa. So I have uh, listed in chat all the links that are part of this presentation. So you uh, feel free to uh, look those up and get more information, or you are welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask any questions you have. Anyone have a project that they're thinking about or anything that they would like to share? We have a number of uh, community partners. Debbie, yes, go ahead. My question is, um, you gave us a lot of links, which is awesome, and a lot of really great information. I think you've answered everybody's questions. Um, so if we go to your website after that, if we didn't get them all in the chat, is it all on your application, all, all of the links? Yes, okay. we have the information on the website and we have the videos as well to guide you. And the best thing for you to do is to go to that grant portal and begin uh, your process of setting up your profile. And uh, I believe the grant window opens April 11th. So right now, what would be really helpful is to collect, if you're a new applicant, to collect all the information like your, uh, address, contacts, all the background information about your grant application. If you can start to collect all that, then when the grant window opens, you can begin to add all of that information. It's kind of like signing up. You're signing up. You don't have to do anything other than put all your information and have it ready, whether you apply next cycle or two cycles from now, but you already have that account set up on there. But you can't start your profile until the 11th, right? I believe so. Um, Thea, I think Thea is on the, the line. Well, you can, can you correct? Your profile. You, can, you can set up your profile and set up your account. You just will not be able to submit an application. So you are able to go in there and draft an application if you want to. Although we do recommend probably drafting. If you're going to draft, um, either draft it in Word or watch that. Um, there's a save button. It doesn't automatically save. So I believe the save button is there. You just won't be able to submit anything until that window starting the 11th. So you can go in and view the application and see um, what exactly is on there and what it looks like and play around in there. You just can't submit anything yet. Oh, great. So thank you, Thea. So that will save people time. That would be good for those of you who are thinking about applying if you could begin building your profile this week. I also will say that there is the narrative questions are available in a Word document format. So if you just, because that's kind of what the bulk of the text is. So if you wanted to just start drafting the narrative portion and you didn't want to do that in flux, those are available on our website under the resources tab and you can um, 
just copy and paste into Flux as well, if that's easier for you. I know some people have different preferences about where they like to type things and how they like to work, so. Thank you. Robert? Yes, um, one of the things I'm, we've been trying to work on is at, at the Creighton Pawn Shop, the building there on 164th and Highway 99, he's shutting it down. And it's got about two to three months left and it needs some remodel. He wants us to open up a resource center, which we want to do. Downstairs would be like a sobering unit or a protection unit uh, for domestic violence. We haven't decided. But um, upstairs, we want to be able to have a laundry, kitchen, and uh, showers. And so that people can come in the morning and meet with the case manager, with offices with case managers, and then give them a sack lunch. We take them out and they can work for the day. And then when, come, when they come back, they can uh, meet with their case manager to see if, what appointments were set up and we'll help transport. But also um, so they can get a hot meal. Their laundry had been done if they dropped it off and they can get a shower. And that way they're um, encouraging them to come back the next day and work with the case manager so we can get them into housing detox or treatment or uh, domestic violence whatever and i'm looking for we're looking for whatever support we can get creighton was trying to sell the building um and give it to us but he's only going to sell it to somebody who's going to turn it into a resource center for us but even though that's still on the table the main thing is is that if he holds on to the building he has to maintain a specific amount of rent per month and um, we can probably get the remodel done fairly cheap. I want to start this conversation because when I saw your map, we're right there. And that's one of the highest uh, crime rate areas right now. And I know we can do a lot of good because we're constantly running into people that, you know, need our services and need more help. If that's of interest or an idea to anybody, you know, I'm open for a suggestion. Sonny is online here and he uh, does all our grant writing and stuff. But if that's something that the community would like to get involved with, we want you there. We want other organizations upstairs that have offices so we can address things immediately and give them help. I'll be quiet now. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. And it does sound really intriguing. And I love the idea of co-location of services and creating a one-stop to make it easier for the residents to access everything they need. I would strongly recommend that you uh, reach out to Zoe, Reese, and you and even you and Sunny, if possible, uh, send her an email to schedule time to talk through your ideas and services and what you would envision the verdant funding going towards. Uh, since we have a couple different pots, it'd be helpful for Zoe to understand a little bit more about the project and the timeline. And then we may be able to also guide you as to which quarter is the best one for you to apply as well. And so her, I think it's in the chat, but I'll repeat it just in case. It's Zoe, Z-O-E dot Reese, R-E-E-S-E -E -E, at verdanthealth.org. Wonderful. Any others? Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us. If we have no further questions, we're going to end this recording. We look forward to uh, your applications and please don't hesitate to reach out to us if there's anything we can do to help you. If you have challenges with setting up your profile, if you have challenges with Flex, our team members are here to support you and to make this as smooth a process as possible.